Alright, today is Tuesday, 7-11, the 11th of June. This is a preview of the upcoming CPI, aka the CPLI. Now folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Let's begin with this. The expectations are... It's going to be a really low CPI reading, perhaps 3%, maybe even below 3%. We will witness the biggest orgasm in the history of the stock market. The headlines coming out saying, here's how Wednesday's inflation report could push U.S. stocks even higher. We just got a weak CPI rating from China. And the assumption is, if China's CPI is weak, perhaps our CPI is going to be weak too. And somehow, this is not an indicator of a recession in the economy. This is just uh, uh, the, the golden path, as that moron Goolsby from Chicago says. This is the soft landing. Inflation goes down, everything else goes higher. Makes sense, doesn't it? My home price is going to rebound. My uh, car price is going to rebound. My stocks are going to rebound. My bonds are going to rebound. But somehow, inflation is not going to rebound. And the expectations are, here it is, headline CPI at 3.1 year on year. Economists anticipate the annual U.S. headline inflation rate to further ease in June, dropping from 4% to 3.1%. Now, you might look at this and say, oh my God, inflation is dropping like a rock. Except, of course, when you go back to the grocery store. But anyways, the drop will be pretty much 100% due to the base impacts. We'll talk about that in a minute, but this will mark the 12th, 12th, consecutive month of declines and the lowest reading since March 2021. On a monthly basis, the headline CPI is expected to show a faster pace of growth at 0.3% compared to 0.1% recorded in May. So this is really important. Month on month, inflation goes higher. Year on year, it goes down. This is why we call it the CPI. When it comes to core CPI, which is perhaps all eyes will be in core CPI, the expectations are 5% year on year. Analysts project a slowdown in the annual U.S. core inflation rate for June, with a decline from 5.3% to 5%. If realized, this would be the lowest level since November of 21. On a monthly basis, the core CPI is expected to show a slight deceleration in rate of increase, going from 0.4% to 0.3%. We have more good news for you if we look at the Adobe Digital Price Index, the DPI. Prices across the board, if you if you look month on month, they're down for the most part. Led by uh, flowers, no love for flowers. What happened to romance? Just pump and dump, right? Just like the stock market. Anyways, apparel, down 3.38%. We have some categories rebanding such as jewelry, but all of these are goods, online goods. We know that the problem with this inflation in the economy that we have right now is not due to goods. That was last year. Now the majority of the problem is services and big ticket items such as homes and of course cars. We'll talk about that in a minute, but more good news for you. Headline reads, inflation expectations return to the Fed's 2% target according to the Cleveland Fed research. Boom, it's over. As soon as the market opens tomorrow, all in. You're going to bet it all in that the market is going to explode significantly higher. It's going to work out, I promise you. Anyways, you know when they say the devil is always, always in the details. And this is what the market is going to be fixated on. Sure, we got a 3% handle. Maybe 2.9, 2.8, but it's all about the details. In this case, when we talk about inflation expectations, according to the Bank of New York, forget about Cleveland, the median one year ahead expected inflation rate is dropping like a rock. But the median three year inflation expectations is now at threes and it's sticking here and actually moving higher again. So in the long run, forget about the Fed's target of 2%. It's not going to happen without blowing this economy up. And speaking of uh, details, when you segment these inflation expectations by category, the majority of these expectations that say inflation will go down, it's because of gas. I'm not talking about farts here. I'm talking about the gas station because energy prices are down. But we know that energy prices are so volatile, they can pop higher again at any time. Food is also leading the decline in inflation expectations. I don't know, last time I was at the grocery store, I'm still paying an arm and a leg. Maybe I'm shopping at the wrong store. Maybe I should go back to the 99 cent store. But anyways, you look at the other categories, college education, now that Joey B is not going to pay your student loans, those expectations are going higher. Medical care, that's going higher. Rent is going higher and we know that shelter is the biggest component of the cpi now we just produced a video for the members of this channel and the title is bad news equals bad news good news equals bad news why do we say that well you can stop being cheap and become a member 
and then see the whole video. But let's start with the easy one. Bad news equals bad news. Bad news meaning the expectations are CPI is going to be so low, 3%, even 2.8%. What if it comes out higher though? Then that's easy. Bad news equals bad news. We're going to see a sell-off in the stock market. Dollar is going to spike higher. Yields are going to spike higher too. And of course, if it's going to happen, it's going to be led by the core CPI. You look at the month-on-month -month ratings, the core CPI is actually sticking but starting to move higher a little bit. And the headline reads, dollar is in solid shape to rebound as Fed dovishness running dry, according to the ING. Okay, that's the easy part. Bad news equals bad news. We got it. What about good news? Why is good news equals bad news, Maverick? I think you're just a perma bear. Well, hold your horses and grab another diaper because you just wet yourself. But anyways, look at this chart right here. We covered this tonight. It's called the OIH, the Oil Services ETF. This is a weekly chart. It looks that this is moving higher. It's about to go back to the highs. Here's another one, the XLE, the Energy ETF. This one looks like it's about to break higher. Well, why do we see energy ETFs and energy stocks moving higher? What's going on here? I thought inflation is over. And the main reason we have headline CPI down is because of energy prices going down. They appear to be rebounding. Why? We talked about the supply cuts by OPEC Plus, but the main driver is the dollar going down. The dollar goes down. Come on, Commodities will appreciate in value, and we will see more demand for energy and more demand for energy stocks. And that's inflationary. Why is this important? We can jerk off what we want for the reading we're about to get tomorrow, but it's only down because of the base impacts. If we look at June of last year, the base impacts are 1.2%. That's going to be shaved off out of any CPI reading we get tomorrow. So the base impacts alone will drop the CPI down. But in the next month, we have no base impacts at all. Zero. So we get a good reading this month. Then the dollar goes down. Energy rebounds. Commodities rebound. Inflation expectations rebound as a result. But we get the July CPI, and that could be a shocker. And then what happens? Jackson Hole 2.0. But we'll take it one step at a time. If we look at the latest CPI that we got last month, what is the problem here? You look at the month-on-month -month ratings, the reason why the CPI was down, it's all about energy. Energy products are down. The dollar goes down, energy prices are going to recover. But the main problem in the last reading was used cars and trucks. Up 4 0.4%. A lot of folks thought this was a typo, including me, by the way, but it's not. It's showing that used cars prices went higher. Well, we got some good news yesterday. The Mannheim used vehicles value index is actually down. So problem solved. Used cars prices will go down and the CPI is going to be down at zero if you take CPI X everything, according to government propagandist Paul Krugman. But anyways, there's a clear correlation here between the Mannheim index and the CPI. So it's not a bad assumption that used cars prices are going down. The CPI will go down too. But there is a catch. You see in Twitter, this is uh, an account called Car Dealership Guy. He's an insider in car dealerships and he spits out information from time to time. Now, I happen to be an insider in money management. He's an insider in car sales and he says something very strange is happening. Used car supply is at historic low, yet we just experienced the largest monthly decline in used car prices on record. Now, pay attention because, as we say, the devil is always, always in the details. But that does not make sense. If supply is so low, prices should be, should stay high, right? Question mark. Wrong. It seems like between the credit crunch, aka lack of financing availability for consumers, and here's the most important part, rapidly increasing new car incentives, used car prices are beginning to experience accelerated deflation. Weird times, my friends. Now, I tweeted why I think this is happening, but we'll take it one step at a time. He also adds that the ironic part about declining used car prices it's not due to waning consumer demand. Are you paying attention or not? Let me explain. A large chunk of car buyers in the U.S. are payment shoppers, quote-unquote. In other words, they are price-insensitive consumers who mostly care about their monthly payment. So what is actually driving the decline in used car prices? Question mark. Answer, auto lenders. The lending standards have tightened. I wonder why. No more subprime loans. One, reduced loan to value ratios. Number two, larger down payments. Number three, bigger fees, etc. And that is killing sales conversion. Now couple that with historically low used cars inventory and voila, perfect storm. Bottom line, this is really important. Bottom line, consumer demand is still here, but lending supply has declined. 
In the last two years, all of these credit card companies, all of these uh, small lenders, and even big ones, have been issuing subprime auto loans. And now we have the phenomenon of a lot of buyers who are setting on negative equity on their vehicles, meaning they owe more than what the vehicle actually worth. But I have another theory here, and it relates to homes. See, when we look at existing home sales, they're dropping like a rock. And you can look at that and say, oh my God, the economy is in a recession. Look at what's going on with existing home sales. But when you understand that you have a lot of folks who already locked in a 3% mortgage rate, the mortgage rate right now is 7% plus. If they sell their homes, they're in deep trouble. So everybody's now stuck in their homes. Hence, we don't have existing home sales. But if you look at new home sales, those are exploding higher. So what does that say? Are we really in deflation? Is inflation really receding because consumer demand is being eradicated out of the economy? The answer is absolutely not. The consumer has been waiting for prices to go down. Prices are not going down. Consumer has been waiting for supply to show up. Supply is not showing up because nobody wants to sell their homes. But the moment we have a new supply of homes, they get scooped out immediately like hot cakes it tells you the aggregate demand in the economy is way too hot and the overall demand remains a problem for the fed and for the prospects of inflation going down and i believe that the same thing is happening here in the cars market lending standards sure but what have we been getting recently supply of new cars if you work in a dealership you know that how do i know that because i watched the ports and the ports had a lot of cars that are now moving in and immediately this supply is being scooped so the consumer is shifting from used cars to new cars. That's why we see used car prices going down. But it's not because inflation is going down. Inflation is shifting from used to new. Here's the headline. Strong demand drives U.S. new vehicle sales higher in the first half of the year. Demand for new SUVs, trucks, and cars in the U.S. picked up steam in the second quarter. But the stronger sales kept prices high for consumers. Auto sales rose a healthy 16.8% from April through June to just over 4.1 million. Here's the important part. Fueled by pent-up demand from nearly two years of short supplies. Bingo, bingo. And they say that this is due to factories that were hobbled by the global computer chip shortage. Anyways, for much of the year, average prices pulled back a bit and automakers raised discounts a little. Here's the important problem. But in June, those trends began to stall out, said Ivan Dury, the director of insights for Edmunds.com. Consumers paid an average of 45978 bucks per vehicle in June. Wow. I like my old clunker. I haven't been shopping for a new vehicle for a long, long time. 46000 the average for a new vehicle is absolutely stunning. But anyways, that is flat from June of last year, but almost 1400 bucks less than December of 22 when prices peaked. Inventory in dealer lots was expected to be just over 1.2 million vehicles in June, about the same as most of this year. Because of increased demand, supplies are not growing. What does that mean? We have more inflation coming in the pipeline. Electric vehicle sales continued to rise during the first half of the year to more than 557,000 vehicles, or 7.2% of all new vehicle sales. In all of last year, consumer bought just over 807,000 EVs, or just 5.8% of new vehicle sales. So we see EV sales shooting up higher. Part of the reason is the government is now giving incentives, pretty much buying the vehicle for you. In the state of California, a Tesla Model 3 is cheaper than a Toyota Camry. Thank you to the incentives by the government. Every comrade gets an EV. Every comrade gets a souffle. That's capitalism, baby. Free market. When the government puts its thumb on the scale for you to buy a Tesla over a Toyota Camry. That's free market, isn't it? Anyhow, with prices flat, an average new vehicle interest rates of around 7% expected to stay elevated through at least the summer. Dury says those in the market for a new car should hold off buying if they can. If they can't, they should figure out if they need as many bells and whistles, or they can just get an EV uh, courtesy of the government. But anyways, any of those upgrades are likely going to cost you far more than you might have expected. GM led all automakers in the second quarter sales with almost 690,000, a 19% increase year on year. Toyota, which had been in the second place, posted sales of 569,000, up 7%. Ford will release sales on Thursday. Stellantis sales rose 6% for the quarter, while Nissan sales jumped by 33%, and Honda's leaped 45% 
over poor numbers from a year ago due to parts shortages. Hyundai and Kia sales each rose 15% from a year ago. Subaru sales were up 22%. Does this look like consumer demand waning or a recession? Of course not. This is all inflationary. And here are more details for you. The Wall Street Journal says US new vehicle sales rise an estimated 13% in the first half of the year. Dealers and car executives point to pent up demand from shoppers who've been on the sidelines for three years as vehicle shortages resulted in slim picking and high prices. There you go. Now that supply chain pressures have eased, it's really important to understand that automakers are more consistently shutting out vehicles. Buyers are responding and sales are bouncing back faster than many analysts have expected. Listen to this, consumer confidence is still here, mostly because there has been uh, that backlog of supply for so long. This is according to Scott Kunis, the chief operating officer of uh, Wisconsin Bay Clinic. Who cares? The surprise strength in the auto sector reflects resilient, here it is, resilient consumer demand elsewhere in the economy. Oh, really? Is it resilient or is it a necessity? We've been waiting, waiting, waiting. We need a car. At some point, we have to capitulate. If the consumer is so resilient, then why do we see credit card debt shooting up significantly higher? Anyways, they say the resilient consumer demand elsewhere in the economy, from furniture to groceries and travel, as Americans continue to spend through economists' predictions of a slowdown. So somehow we're going to continue to spend, but inflation is not going to make a comeback. Okay, I got a bridge to sell you in Zimbabwe. But anyways, for car shoppers, that means any return to the deep discounting and end of the month blowout sales that have long been hallmarks of the car business appear unlikely in the short term. There you go. New cars prices going higher. For the automakers, the frothier prices that U.S. shoppers have been willing to pay could continue to fuel the strong uptick in profits they have enjoyed since the pandemic. This constant fear that pricing is going to drop and crater and destroy the profitability has been proven unfounded, according to Bank of America analyst John Murphy, adding, it's just not going to happen in a huge way over the next two plus years. Wow. You're wondering why you were seeing uh, GM and Ford and all of these automaker stocks exploding higher? Here it is. Reinflation. If you believe that it's only stocks that will move higher with no inflation, boy, you got another thing coming for you. And here's the insanity. Buyers continued up for pricier models and features this year has surprised GM. People are continuing to buy up, according to Douche Bank. Last month, Cox Automotive said it would raise its full-year U.S. vehicle sales forecast to 15 million vehicles, and the previous estimate of 14.1 vehicles. Listen to this. The increase has been driven by surprisingly strong demand from individual buyers, as well as businesses and other commercial customers, according to Cox. Now, the bulls would look at this and say, hey, this is soft landing, inflation going down, but consumer spending activities remain too hot. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Did I say too hot? You see what the problem here is? You can't have your cake and eat it too. There's no such thing as soft landing, but there's something called reinflation. And the longer this continues, we're going to end in a massive stagflation problem in this economy. Economy. We have more and more inflation coming in the pipeline, from new car sales to wages. Wages continue to go higher. Look at what's going on at UPS. Look at what's going on in California. The headline reads, California Senate passes a 25 bucks minimum wage for healthcare workers. Now, I happen to own a healthcare business. I know it is pretty much impossible to find employees. You have to pay more and more and more. We're talking salaries in the 200000 plus for nurses, healthcare workers, because nobody wants to do the job for less and the demand is too hot. So as an employer, you have to pay. And of course, if you look at the Atlanta Fed overall wage tracker and the average hourly earnings, of course, they went down a tick. But can they come back? The answer is absolutely yes. Here's a tweet from Liz Young. She says inflation adjusted wage growth might be accelerating after trending down over the last two years. Like much of the data right now, the takeaway is in the eye of the beholder. Could mean increased productivity, according to the soft landing crowd, or could mean increased costs and decreasing margins. Be careful what you wish for here. And why do we say that we're going to have stagflation here? We talked about the icy hot phenomenon in the economy. Some sectors in a recession others still in white hot inflation and the consumer is now split you pay more for the necessities you pay more for rent you're gonna have to pay more for a car because you need it you gotta have a car at some point so you're gonna pay the price those monthly payments will continue to go if you need to buy a big ticket item such as a home for example at some point you gotta capitulate you gotta have to accept the seven percent mortgage rate you gotta have to accept the high home prices and now look at this based on the median house price 
and adjusting for CPI. The effective cost of servicing a new mortgage is now back at 1984 level, up more than three times the 2020 lows. So when the consumer is locked with these payments for necessities and big ticket items, can they go out in the economy and splurge to buy restaurants and apparel and all of that? The answer is absolutely not. So underneath the facade of all of this, you look at weekly retail sales. Here's the tweet from uh, Steph Pomboy. Weekly retail sales year on year are dropping like a rock. And at some point, that's going to cause a recession. But in the meantime, we're going to have stagflation. This is the great illusion in this economy. It appears strong on face value. When you start peeling the layers, then you can see what's going to happen to this economy. The Fed will continue to raise rates higher and higher and higher and higher. Either something is going to break, push us into a recession, or even worse. At some point, the margin of these companies will go down. They're going to have to lay off employees. The unemployment rate will spike higher. And then you have all of these consumers stuck with insane mortgages, insane auto loan payments, insane payments for the furniture that they bought and the big ticket items that they bought. What do you think will happen if they lose their jobs? Credit card debt maxed. You don't have to be a genius to put two and two together here and understand what's going to happen. In the meantime, if you agree with this outlook, that you can find opportunities in the stock market. I mean, it's already happening, folks. The home builder stocks shooting up higher. Auto stocks are now shooting up higher. Any big ticket or necessity items shooting up higher. But what about the cyclical side of the economy? Retail stores, restaurants, soon enough travel and leisure. They're not going to hold pretty good. And the end result is stagflation followed by a recession. And folks, we have reached the end of this uh, lovely bedtime story. We have an important day coming out tomorrow, so I have to wrap it up here. This is all I got for you for tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. Look at the size of that trunk. You could put three bodies in it.